yeah, yeah. fine <laughs> mark i'm so happy to talk to you thank and, you uh, happy to talk to you yeah and um and uh, uh i just want to find out what how your situation was how the situation was for you in in, in lockdown in mm. london um can you tell me how what happened in april well I think in London it started in May 2020. Um, well, actually what happened was I was on tour with um, Soweto Gospel Choir mm -hmm. in, in a piece that I choreographed called Anala, which we originally did with Lady Smith Black Mambazo, and they couldn't do it at, in 2019. And so the last place we performed in was Wuhan. So oh, okay. <laughs> I'm making that strange connection. So everyone, exactly. whenever I... It, when I came back, um, every, whenever I mentioned I'd been in Wuhan and teaching workshops at the um, Jackie Chan University and moving around and putting the show on, um, and it was like, oh, <laughs> but um, ac actually, um, it started, all the rumors started happening as soon as we got back, you know, are you guys okay? And what happened um, and and things like that and uh, um, it, yeah it, it started to everyone started to get suspicious and um, and then it suddenly locked down actually so I was uh, with the same production company they went to Dubai and I was supposed to follow them uh, thought well we won't do that I'll stay in London and rehearse with them with dancers here and we can, um, you know, we can video it for later because they would want to start up some things because they've got a contract over there. And, and so I started doing that. So I got dancers in and as we were rehearsing, you know, the lockdown started happening. You know, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. In the end, I think I might be guilty of overstepping the mark a little bit because the dancers actually um, needed the work. And things like that so um so then we stopped completely um, um because the the studios we were working and they had to stop mm -hmm. so um i'm on the board of uh almhurst ballet school in birmingham that's associated mm -hmm. with uh, birmingham royal ballet and they had uh, a visit from the duchess of cambridge because uh, she's the patron of the school and so uh, i was at the end of the line and when she came uh, to talk to me she kept saying and where have you just come from i didn't, oh. want, to I, I didn't want to tell her that i just come from wuhan mm -hmm. and uh, and i kept saying well i've been you know really busy rehearsing and on tour with Soweto gospel choir she said yes but where have you just come from but i managed not to tell her um, and I did actually you know, about two weeks later prince charles got COVID, and so it was i said thank goodness i didn't say anything no. <laughs> <But> they, <laughs> i would have got the blame you know and um and so, so it was it was sort of interesting and my partner teaches in a school for um children with emotional uh, uh problems and um they were locked down um even though they're not supposed to be because they're they're uh, vulnerable children oh. but the school hall was available for me so strangely enough in the first lockdown i had a, the use of their after it had been deep cleaned i had the use of their school hall so in some ways it, it got quite creative for me and also there was no pressure to just keep going out and you know um uh you know teaching and going to my so I'm on, the I'm on the board of a couple of charities so I didn't have to do any of that I could do it all from zoom and I could still be creative I could because I'm at, this is my this is a studio of mine here um, oh, it's basically our flat which I've turned into a studio and I've got a real studio in Portugal but of course we couldn't get to Portugal mm. um, and and so it, it, was, it was very strange uh, but I did get to Portugal because a friend of mine has a dog and she wanted to take her dog to her house in Portugal, her home in Portugal. And so I drove with her um, oh, okay. to Portugal. And, and that, uh, that was possible? That was possible then. Um, and, you know, did all the checks. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, I was there for all of July and all of August. And I'd never done that before. So that was a big change in my schedule. 
to be away from London for for, for two months. Um, and uh, and I have a studio there, so I could work there okay. you know, on, my, on my things in a way. But it was a different kind of working. And what I discovered is because I originally trained to be a painter um, and the scholarship I won, I used it all to, to, to on my you know, really deep training to be a dancer. Um, okay. That's how I paid for it as a teenager. <laughs> because uh, I'm from New Zealand and in those days there weren't, they weren't scholarships really to train to be a dance, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so the art school was over the road from the dance school. Um, and so I was able to get other people to sign me in and do enormous paintings to make it look like um, I was doing a lot of work. But what happened during lockdown, um, because I used to be quite abstract, I thought, well, if, if, ever, if we ever come out of this and I need you know, movement on stage, I started sort of painting and drawing projections of dance stuff. Mm. So it changed the book. It changed my practice actually. So That's now the project. Mm. So the project I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I find that very interesting that you've done that because I I hear that a lot from artists that they, you know, their minds just kept on working and they just mm. found, found solutions and new mm. creative ideas. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but it's a it's a dancer. <laughs> wow. so, uh, and then I had to work out how to animate them. And, and I actually found a way of taking mm -hmm. photographs of them and then playing the fast forward button on the camera and filming that. So it's, um, it's actually made me work, you know, low tech, um, which, I, which I like um, in a completely different way. Um, and also uh, in my last job, it was so 24 seven, I didn't really have time to sit around thinking about stuff. And it sort of gave me that opportunity. So, you know, there were some really good things, especially in the first lockdown. You know? Yeah, this is what, what uh, most people, uh, artists also say, is that that first lockdown was like a time to breathe, you know, just this mm -hmm. time to, to mm -hmm. let everything settle and calm down a little bit. Because, of course, you all have very um, busy lives and, and thinking the whole time and creating the whole time. And mm. also not just a month ahead, years ahead, you know, mm. things are booked and planned. So, mm. uh, so you also found that, 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 it, that slowing down gave you different... It, it, well, mindset. pause for thought. I mean, I'm still going through transition because I hadn't been out of Rombe, you know, for two years before it happened. And I, I knew that it would take me two years to kind of stop thinking 24 seven and planning three years ahead you know uh, all the programs and I, I, I wanted to go back to my own work so it's you know thinking about my own work and who can I, who I could apply to and in fact I was busy writing letters because in the first lockdown we made a small film with with my dancers and I was sending it around you know um, and so I sent it to the Manchester International Festival but of course you can't have international festivals during this period. So they were writing back to begin with and then it stopped because clearly they couldn't do any work. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I sent it to the Barbican and said as well, and I got a letter back from the director of Sadler South Wales saying, you know, all we're trying to do at the moment is survive. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's been, it's, it's in a way, um, now that I'm not associated with a, an organization, I'm associated with my own organization, and then I have patronages, um, uh, you know, which have become very useful during this period because uh, the school um, where I taught Black History Month during lockdown, um, because they, we were able to go in and teach them in their bubbles. And it's a tiny school, there's like 70 pupils. Um, and, you know, so they had to come in the doors and leave by in a particular way, all the staff uh, were, were had, you know, visors and um, were masked. And so it was a, a whole different way. And of course, with me, it did change the nature of the work because you can't do duets. Oh, know? yeah, yes. And, and then people would arrive to do solos. So most of it's solos, actually, the work I did during lockdown, because it was the safest thing to do. Um, and, you know, it was just me and um, after a while, a cameraman. But of course, you can be at a distance as well. Um, yeah. 
this is um, uh, two things. Um, uh, the, the one is, is I find it so fascinating that uh, theatres now adapt very well to this mm. and mm. really cautious of how they, uh, you know, how things operate inside. And of course, mm -hmm. it's not just the, the, the artist, it's also the, 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 um, the, technic, the technic staff and, and so on. Mm. Um, I, I think the difficult thing about theatres is that you need to be in the large scale theatres, which I'm used to, you need to be um, very full for it to make any money at all. And that's the thing that they've had to reconfigure how the, how the organisation is going to make money. And I'm so pleased I led on the, on the building project for Rombert because only companies who own their own buildings got a government grant to see them through it, oh, um, Arts Council grant. So, you know, freelancers have had a terrible time here. Um, yeah. because but all over the world, you know, all yes. the freelancers yes. are saying the same thing. Mm. Um, but, but then you also said that, you know, you, you could carry on, but in just in a different way. That's just rethinking mm. how you, you know, like you're saying solos instead of, of uh, partners or, or mm. partnering. Yeah. Uh, do you think this will also influence you in, in the way you create in the future? I think the way I'm thinking about it, because I've got a big project coming up called Melody Space, which is actually for the school with the um, social, emotional, mental health um, children who are permanently excluded from mainstream education. But of course, if you teach them dancing and art, you know, they can do that so easily um, because they're sort of strangely hardwired to be creative. Um, and it would get them into trouble in other ways, you know. Uh, otherwise, they struck. They really do struggle. Um, and then uh, Birmingham Royal ba uh, Royal Ballet is associated with Elmhurst Ballet School, and so to use um, some of the, you know, one of their, their fifteen year olds basically. Um, and so I'm trying to do a unity piece which brings it all together, you know. And, yeah. So, um, you know, at the moment, the premiere for the Birmingham students is in Birmingham and the one for the school is here in London for the school. And then I was working with professional freelance dancers in the summer. And so they know what to do already. We, we just have to get them fit and back in the studio. Um, and so it's, it's and then um, there's a very small company in Newcastle and they actually did a part of it in their own Zoom performances. Um, and so. It, it, if you stick it together that way, mm. you can come up with something. But, but you know, I'm having to apply for a grant. Clearly, no one's going to make any money from this. Mm. Um, and, you know, in a way, I suppose I've always worked for the Arts Council, so I'm doing it again. <laughs> no. um, but um, um, can I tell you, uh, ask you the, uh, the school, the, um, because this is also fascinating. I photographed a lot of music students here in Vienna because we have got mm. the music university here mm. and a lot of them were talking about this uh, the the ones that are leaving this the the university to to have mm. to audition and start a new career or really? start or go into the the real life mm. uh, they they struggled really because it's uh, in in that time auditions were cancelled um mm. And they were sort of, they were sort of thinking, what now? You know, where are we going now? Because they've studied already. Mm. And I was wondering at the at the ballet schools, uh, how did you manage those, or, or how did they manage those last? You know, because it's the last year is always this this oh, time for the audition yeah. and and you yeah. know the the big end of year performances and things like that. Well, originally I started this so that those students could make up their time by being in a professional, um, because it's, it's actually, uh, it's the Messiah by Handel is the music. And because I work with the uh, Barbican London School Symphony Orchestra, uh, I don't know. Uh, and they've all really struggled with getting um, experience before they go out to the real world. And, and so originally I started thinking, well, how can we help? the students with some you know, real proper on stage stuff, working in a production, um, working with a choreographer. 
uh, and uh, working with uh, you know, music and an orchestra, um, which I'm used to, of course. So um, that's one of the reasons I started it, because they have really lost out, you know, those, those graduate students in their final year. Uh, but apparently um, they're quite busy at the moment um, doing all kinds of things. And so I'm using the next ones down. But in a way, that's quite good, because that means next year we could put it all together with all those groups maybe in the same venue as my wish so you know it does make you think about unity and it does make people think about what other people are doing because we've all suffered the same thing whereas england is quite class ridden actually you know um and uh you know you have very poor areas and very rich areas and so there's this constant battle to try and bridge the gap between those things and also bridge the gap between what happens in London because London's huge and it has all the great ballet and music and contemporary dance and then there's the rest of England and Britain um, so it's actually thinking about unity spread so at the moment we've got partners in Cambridge, Newcastle, Birmingham um, uh, yeah and that, that's good actually that is a really good way to see the arts uh, and and so I was thinking of them when that, that this came up to try and make up for some of the time that they had, had lost. Because, you know, being on stage, really having to pull all the stops out, I mean, that shifts your, you know, your training into a different sphere. Uh, but they have, they did do a film actually in lockdown, you know, uh, they did Nutcracker. Oh, um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Some, some of the students, but mm -hmm. not all of them, if you see what I mean. And also, um the sector's changing they now know that they're not going to just move into the big ballet companies mm. you know Birmingham Royal Ballet is like the Royal Ballet but it's you know up from up north that's not going to happen that they're going to be part of something a portfolio, a portfolio. Yeah. I'm trying to encourage them to think about that and uh, you know try and develop them as the you know entrepreneurs in their own right so, because yeah. often if you're a dancer you're just told what to do and you do it but now you're you're told what to do and actually you you what you're going to do how you're going to do it when you're going to do it and you need to raise the money for it as well so it's it's a whole different ball game from when people came out of ballet schools um you know before lockdown because a lot of those little companies or freelance choreographers and groups no longer exist mm. so it's, it's that's very interesting that that's happening because it's, it can also be a positive for yes. them. Mm. But uh, another thing that I, um, I want to ask you, because um, I, I've spoken to many musicians say this, and I've uh, mm. recently spoken to, to dancers also who say this, that they, in this quiet time where they had, say, the, uh, the first um, lockdown where they were in their homes and and they had to do class or zoom mm. class you know and mm. and also by themselves they actually rediscovered things about themselves and and they uh, also thought a lot about the artistry and also um mm. rediscovered what their bodies could do and you know mm. sort of focus mm. more on that mm. uh do you think that the students now that the these students that are now more at home and and out of this environment of uh, because for for ballet school uh, pupils there is a sort of a pressure also you know on on, on their training and so on mm -hmm. that they maybe now start being more creative in themselves because there's no not this constant pressure of of this routine because they have a very strict routine uh, during the day do you think we, we will see more creativity from them? Maybe more young uh, choreographers? I hope so. I hope so. Because, um, do you know, uh, I think in this country anyway, the government had started cutting back on the arts, um, you know, because they said they had huge debts. Um, and also some of them couldn't see that the humanities are vital to our existence. So, um, I hope that's true. You know, you, you don't know. And of course, they need stimulus and they need to learn from people who have done it for years. And so being in a repertoire company, of course, you get to work with a whole range of people, some of whom aren't alive anymore, but you learn stuff. And actually, your fitness level goes up 
when you're having to perform every night for several weeks rather than just sitting at home doing it on your own that's a that's a different thing so uh, you know it has really um impacted on you know what we call performing and i think um one of the things that might come out of it is that people see performing in a different way do you know that they're part of a much larger picture rather than just a, a tiny cog? Um, and that, and uh, there'll be a different concept of what going to the theatre to see ballet is. And also with all the technology and everyone's got used to Zoom, as I said, my, one of the pieces for the larger thing, I was performed on Zoom and it went really well, got a fantastic review. Um, but that's quite good because it sort of sets up the rest, if you like. People, people, people sort of know what it is. And so technology will become more of live performance. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, uh, it'll be different and you'll be able to reach different countries, whereas people have to tour all the time. But there's a whole sector here that, you know, they have the, you know, good companies in London, small companies run by a single choreographer. And what they would do is they could, would go to Europe and back all the time. And that's mm -hmm. how they would survive because actually touring in Britain it's really expensive and most of the audiences in regional cities and towns don't, aren't really interested <laughs> oh, unless, it's, unless it's something gigantic, you know, that they, or unless their kids are involved. Hmm. And so at Romba, I used to do it by hiring a local choir and they'd bring all their relatives and neighbours. Um, oh. And then I have lots of brass bands here. So, and then I did another project where we used all the local brass bands. And that worked in a different way. That was much more cultural actually than the choir thing. Um, and so I was always looking for those kinds of options, you know, workshops for locals. If you had one person in the company that was from that town sort of city, it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it, was, it wasn't us showing up with something cool and from London, it was actually had something to do with them. So yeah. I think relating to people outside London, it's different now that, you know, they. All have computers. They all have screens, and it's it's looking for it's looking for different avenues for performance rather than come to the theatre. Well, Mark, you seem to to have been creative anyway in your thinking, and in you know, <laughs> so so this is just a a new uh, a new way of for you to to solve a problem and to get solution. Well, I hope it's a solution. You never know, of course. No. You know. Yeah. I wanted to do a unity piece for ages because, um, you know, we're, we're, things like this, you think it brings us together in another way, but, but actually it's quite, it fractures us even more. Um, and then working with a, a school for um, SEMH pupils, you realise, you know, they're, they're, they're banned from uh, mainstream education forever. Uh, even though they're creative and they're way out in haze. Um, whereas the Royal Ballet School or um, um, Elmhurst, that's associated with Birmingham, they're way up in Birmingham. So the, it, 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 it could be a way of bringing all these little pockets together mm -hmm. under one umbrella. That's what I'm hoping. So, mm -hmm. so it's called melody space, you know, the space where the melodies happen. Amazing. Um, oh. And the music is Messiah. And so it's all in tiny little sections. Uh, and I did one of these pieces for Rombert in 2016. It's still online. You can still see it on um, BBC The Space. And it's called The Creation, which is uh, another oratorio by um, uh, Haydn. And I can have a look, yeah. Mm. Have a look. It's written in tiny. If you send me your email, I'll send you the link. It's written in tiny little bits, you know, because it's in three movements. And, and I think, um, you know, the text is strange and old fashioned for us, but the Baroque music and the tunes, absolutely incredible. But I meant that to be a unity piece, but you know, it's such a big company and you try and you're so busy. And I got, I managed to get the Rombe School involved and the dancers and the BBC singers and Garsington Opera, but we couldn't bring groups who, uh, you know, the the big thing is that you with those big things is is that you can get people, let I suppose from the community to share the stage, with um with top level dancers, and they don't need to be so elite anymore. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? 
once upon a time you went to see this principal dancer and that work, but but actually we don't need to do that anymore. We there, are, there has to be other ways of viewing dance, you know, because it it is it can come across as quite elite, and you know the sectors of contemporary dance which are like that, and set, set, you know ballet can be like that. It's all about affordability and the ticket, but actually dancers have such a lot to offer um, society yeah. in general. This is what I, I really feel strongly about, is that we start talking about also uh, art in education. Mm. Uh, and we're talking about the children now with the emotional uh, problems that they are excluded from mainstream schools. But mm. I, I wish that we could start uh, talking about and, and, and uh, insisting that schools have art alongside maths and science so mm. that that mm. um you know compulsory to to do and from a very young age from school entry and that art is not just seen as a friday afternoon subject yeah. or a little here half an hour and there but that it's really seen as very important because if i think those children that you're talking about now mm. this is how they express themselves this is how they can express themselves yeah yeah. And we have to we have to look at this in in the school system as well, and not wait for children to be the age of fourteen or fifteen to go to an art school. And as you say, you know the art schools are really not very inclusive. You know they are you, you have to have funding or or sponsorship or because they're quite expensive to be to go they're to very, you know, in, in England. Yes. And um, yes, I would, I would love to have your opinion on this. I, um, I also work with the Professor of Comparative Cognition at Clare College, Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was at Romberg, I made her a scientist in residence. And she tells me that, you know, science without the humanities has no future. Because, um, and she does, and she looks after all the doctorate students, um, as well as her 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 own studies and um and she, and when she looks across to see what they've done um she often says well the trouble is there's no le no good learning all this information unless you can be creative with it so she's you know she favors people who have done something creative when she's choosing who's going to do a doctorate um so it, it, it's an interesting from the top level that they do it, it you know in fact she uses quite strong expletives and when she describes science without the humanities. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right, because now they don't teach music at school here um, and they don't teach art. So um, as a trained fine artist and as someone who ran an orchestra, because mom had an orchestra as well, and someone who's always in, been interested in music, um, although I didn't read till quite late as a, as a school kid, but music, I was like straight in there. So, um, so you're, you're absolutely right. You can learn things in a different way through, through the humanities. I mean, I, might, I um, think that's very important. You know, I don't know how to make it hugely important, um, but I think it's really important. And uh, they stopped teaching dance at schools as well. But um, all the pupils at the school, this um, SEMH school, um, they, all say that they love dance pretty much across the board because often if kids are good a lot it helps them to 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 relax and um you know it could give them a future you know which they people thought they could never have mm -hmm. so you know it, it, it's interesting you don't realize it until you actually work with them and do a project um you know that it brings all these other things out you know it's it's actually trying to work out now how to track um a, a progression uh, with this primary school. So, you know, so it, so it, would, it would needs another syllabus. Mm -hmm. And I help write the Rombear syllabus, uh, but they've changed it now. They call it the Rombear grades. Um, but because I can see the humanities and how that affects, you know, what you see, what you hear, how your brain works, um, and, it's, and it's about curiosity, play, um, you know, they, they haven't actually included any of those, that stuff in the new syllabus, it's just physical. So I think they've missed a point, a trick there. So I, I might try and use my 
influence to see if I can um, influence that, but I don't think I would be able to. And but, you know, we could get together sometime and make up a whole syllabus for, for school children. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I would love that, yeah. Because mm. um, um, there's such a gap, you see, there's such yeah, a gap. Definitely, and, and the more, I mean, actually the research has already been done they not not enough i think but but there there, uh, there is already so much research mm. and um uh, i do think the, the the other thing that i think about uh also is that for example i look at ballet mm. we have this perception that or or let me explain it this way so if you see a ballet performance or a dance performance, usually in, in a big theater. It looks so effortless, but it looks so perfect. It looks so yes. everything, you know? Mm. And it looks almost unreachable. You know, mm. you, you just mm. think, oh, you know, you hear many people say, also in art, you know, uh, painting, you hear people say, oh, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not an artist, I can't paint. Mm. Yet there's so many facets on that. It's not just to, to reproduce a, a picture, Absolutely. it's really, you know, mm. so people's perception from the school already is I mm. can't draw, so I can't be a painter or I can't mm. be an artist. Mm. Mm. And I was wondering if we start talking, I, I, or you as artists, as dancers, start talking more about like you told me now how you became a dancer, you know, how you started off in New Zealand and, and you came here and or there in, in England. Um, and many have this path that they go that and and all the all the artists I talk to have all different paths some come from musical families some have nobody in the in the family whatsoever mm. you know playing an instrument yet there was somebody on their path that gave them the inspiration and somebody helped them and mm. and if we start you know we live in a in a also in a world where people say come back to reality or dreams you know dreams are just dreams or mm -hmm. but it, this was your dream and it's coming true and it came true and and so all these productions you are thinking about so mm -hmm. if we can teach children not teach but but show people and show communities and show smaller communities what mm -hmm. really is uh, that, that the art is not just the part that you're on the stage the mm. art and, and the artist, it's its part of this journey. It's part of yeah. this growing and learning and developing because you didn't start off, uh, you know, having your leg up there. You started mm. off in a, in a, you know, or most ballet dancers start off four years old in a small ballet class. Mm. So this, my, my question is, should we not talk more about the journey or... I know journey is a cliche, but the path, you know, how yes. do you become this? Um, I think it's about people following their dreams. I mean, you know, when I was little, my mother always took me, took me to the ballet. And actually, the, 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 um, there was a girl next door, much older than me, she was a teacher, but she used to teach us ballet in her back garden. Wow. Um, and, um, and then when I got to university, and then I did fencing at school. So there was something of about uh, of vocabulary and codes um, in me, and then when I um, when I went to university, I I joined the so I straight away I joined the dance club, and one of the teachers teachers said straight away, you know, if you could find someone to teach you technique for eight hours a day, you could be a dancer. So, wow. um, and then also when I was at school, they um, they thought I was really musical, and I I learned the violin, and then I gave up because I was boarding. And you know, um, and uh, the music teacher, the violin teacher, when I got the music teacher in the school, and they pulled me out of class, and he, they said, "We could make you a fiddler." Um, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Please come back to it. And, but but I couldn't because I was boarding with a family, sharing a room with with someone else, and it, it, it they just made it absolutely impossible for me. But it came out in other ways. Because I can read, I can read a score, so I could always help the conductor and the dancers by reading. So, and I, in fact, I choreograph by reading the score, um, mm -hmm. so it's directly linked to music. But I think um, those kinds of possibilities now are sh more shut down. 
because they're not seen as viable options for people to, uh, uh, for children to learn or for young adults to learn. Um, I think there probably is a swing, much more back to the humanities now, but you know, they're struggling. They'll struggle for ages because COVID co costs such a lot. They will need to um, break that money back somehow. I don't know how they, going to do it but I'm you know when we come out of this properly the taxes will be much heavier and um you know when people die they won't be able to leave things to people they'll have to give it back to the government you know they'll be thinking of things right now to claw back the millions that they've spent and they'd already cut it back because of austerity you know they wanted reserves but by doing that they didn't invest in anything and so the hospitals weren't quite ready, the people weren't quite ready. You know, a lot of poor people um, in this country anyway got sick quickly. There was no investment in um, old folks' homes. They got sick, you know, very, very quickly. The NHS was overwhelmed. So it's, um, and they didn't have the equipment and everything was really slow. Of course, they've got the vaccine now, so that's gonna change something. But I mean, I think to live a life through the humanities in the old days, it, it well, uh, you know, in the 19th century, it used to be industrialization and what you can produce. But actually we've done that so much, we're wrecking the planet and we've got to think of other things now. And that's where the humanities and the creativity and the arts comes in and, you know, science and the arts is both the Royal Academy of Arts here in London and the Royal Society had um, celebrations to celebrate Nikki, Professor Nicola Clayton and I working together. Um, because it's quite unusual for an art, uh, a choreographer and an artist uh, um, and a scientist to work together so consistently for so long. So it's, it, it, people say, oh, well, you're still working with her for, but actually it's been so fruitful in all kinds of ways. She's a child psychologist, a biologist and a zoologist, and she studies uh, crows and children and how they think. Of course, crows can do things, crows can do things children can't do until they're about eight. So it's actually, actually it's, it's really interesting, but because of Brexit, she's, she might lose her crows. She's had them for 34 years because they live till they're over 40. So mm. it's, um, it's gonna be a big blow. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. I would actually love to talk to her. Oh, well, I can give you her number yes. um, mm. if you'd like. Do I have your, if you text me your number and then yes. I can put you in touch. Yes. Um, yeah, she's really interesting. I, I think, and uh, yeah. from a science yeah. thing. Yeah, I, I actually, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a, a marketer or a writer in, in America, Seth Godin, and he talks a lot about the system, the, the school system being um, designed for the industrial era. And you know, we, we, yes. are, we, have, we have developed so much from there that, um, then I think it's time that that the system needs to be um, revamped and uh, and and uh, you know as I say scientists here are doing the research and and we need to listen and uh, especially now in the pandemic you know it's all about health and we we we're seeing uh, many things now we you know some people are affected very badly with this virus and some people are not and mm. we have to also think about that it's not so black and white you know it's not so um that we can see uh that that they can predict so i think there's more to our uh, mental uh, ability and 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 all these things that you know that that we have to start talking about and looking but i'm very passionate about the, the education, I think uh, children should all in the world have exposure to art and they should not mm. be, uh, you know, if they could be a science block, then they can be a music block or an art block mm. or a mm. dance block. In the school. They all listen to music, but none of them don't know anything about classical music. Um, and what we've done is we've, get, we've put a dance teacher in there, but he teaches African dance. Oh, um, okay. He's from, but he's from Manchester. Dark, dark skin black man. Mm. I'm, um, I'm from South Africa, so I'm. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
I was uh, wondering, I've got to hear it in your accent, actually. The accent. <laughs> <laughs> so like when me. you said about Soweto, I, um, yeah, I, it's interesting, this project that you're doing. Yes, I, um, they asked me in 2014 to do it, actually. Um, and uh, and I had to go back to South Africa and meet Joseph Shabalala and um, Lady Smith Black Mambazo, and they really liked me. But oh. I'd done it already in New Zealand because I'd worked with the Royal New Zealand Ballet and one of the tribal groups, and it was terrifying. Oh, wow. you know? and, yeah. and put them together so that they would tour one show. Sold out everywhere, it was amazing. But they now wow. have a director uh, this sounds stereotypical, but she's from America and doesn't really get it. So oh, that work has gone back just to having elite ballet dancers doing Sleeping Beauty and Swan Lake, as much as I like those pieces. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, there's, but they could, because of what they are, they have the ability, those pieces, to reach out to a much broader uh, audience than, 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 than they think. It just takes imagination mm. and inviting people in to look on how that how they can join in yeah. so um and south africa is really fascinating because of all the different cultures they have i mean soweto um gospel choir in just in the choir and the nine singers i had which we did the royal albert hall so i had 16 um they're not all zulus you know so they spoke nine languages lady smith were all zulu so it's sung in zulu and they wanted to make a um, Zulu ballet. Um, oh, and so they were originally working with the Royal Ballet here. And the director at the time, Monica Mason, said, you know, this, this is not working. It just doesn't, it, this, it just, the, the choreographer they had to try and blend those things. She said, why don't you call Mark? Because he did something with the Royal New Zealand Ballet that was a bit like this. And um, and so they called me and I went to South Africa and met them. They liked me and the music was amazing. So it, it it's it's like all these songs sung in Zulu, uh, written by Joseph Shabalala and Alice Spiro, one of the producers. And it's sort of like a day in the life of, you know, from waking up um, in the village, go, some of them emigrated to a city, didn't like it, came back. So, and they're really good at the sort of homesick songs. So, mm -hmm. they, and it's all sung in Zulu, but, it's, but of course, cause it's dancing going on, you don't have to explain it so much. <laughs> so it worked really well and um, it has great reviews. It sold out at the Edinburgh Festival twice. It sold out um, a couple of weeks before it opened in London. Um, and and so it, it personally it was you know very successful for me. It was quite strange. I never thought of myself. Oh, you know, I'll be this contemporary dancer. You know, and I was a classical dancer for a little bit. And I, I never thought that I would move into um, working with um, tribal peoples, even mm -hmm. even though my mum was Fijian. So I was brought up looking at it. Oh, and, okay. and and so it's I think it's much easier. To, to, because it, there used to be all this cultural appropriation stuff going on, but my mum was a black woman and my dad was Irish, so I was oh, brought, brought up with diversity. So I don't really have to qualify anything to anybody. And I also think no one, no one has to really. We're all a mix. So I it's uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think in terms of visibility, going to the Royal Opera House and seeing no black people—that's not good. Mm. That's not good. That means the children that come in think, oh well, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've also said that in the opposite, that I have something here called Ballet Black. But, you know, I'm responsible for all these tiny kids at um, Almost Ballet School. So I don't want any of them going along and saying, well, this isn't for me. You yeah. Because yeah. I'm not black. So you have to, it, there's a, there must be a way of unifying um, these, these differences. And that's why I want this piece to be about unity. Yeah. Um, and people have been very slow to realise well, if I had some black faces, all the mixed race people think, oh, that's for me, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no, in Lon no. London, my partner taught in an inner city school for eight years. And during that time, he had very few white kiddies. Mm -hmm. So we know that the next generations uh, are, are not going to look like, you know, mm -hmm. walking down the street now. So I wanted yeah. Rombert to be like walking down the street in London. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Well, and that's wonderful that you have that. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what to do. I just, you know, it's, it's, it's little steps at a time, isn't it? Yeah. Trying to change awarenesses. But I think you're absolutely right. The creativity with children, just allow them to play around with more stuff and to give them opportunities and to think about their futures in a different way. Yeah. In a much more positive way, right? right. I'm not you know, working in the city, making loads of money and, you know, or an industrialist or something, you know. You know, yeah. your purpose can be other things yeah uh, and, and many people have this misconception i think you know because even even i know of ballet dancers who uh, young ballet dancers saying if somebody asks oh, oh what job do you do and say i'm a ballet dancer oh no but what's your real job so <laughs> no. there are some people who don't even understand that mm -hmm. that could be an occupation you know so absolutely um, yeah, were you a dancer you no, dancing? no, no, I wasn't, no. Because um, no, Nikki was, Nikki's a dancer, the professor. She's a dancer. She was a oh, dancer. So yeah. her specialty is a tango and salsa. Oh, I see. Now, two of my children are dancers, so I know a little bit about the, the ballet yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. But Mark, tell me, um, I want to ask you one more question. What is your mm. wish for when this is all over? Uh, well, the wish for when this is all over is to have my project live, <laughs> yes, and and to be able to think differently, um, to use different partners rather than being stuck with one company and one idea, and just kind of constantly trying to flog that, which which is what the companies do now. I think they should all have their doors open to a much broader range of activity, um, and and to be much more inclusive not just in who you see on stage, you know, in their education programs and yeah. in, in, in the way that the humanities can engage with the general population. Uh, that, that's, that's the great big wish. Um, and, um, I, you know, and I've, it, it's been my living for a, a long time, but I always feel in the arts world that it sort of, sort of strangles itself. We can't do this, we can't do that. But, and so maybe there'll be less of those abstract um, restrictions. Mm. Yeah, I, I hope so anyway. And all the pupils at Elmhurst, they now know that their lives are gonna be not for one company, but actually a portfolio. So it's actually trying to imagine, you know, what's the, what is that portfolio for them? So, um, you know, one of the reasons I think I met Elmhurst on the board is to help them negotiate that mm -hmm. because all they've done is try and produce classical dancers for the classical world. Um, but, you know, very few or, or any of them get jobs as classical dancers. But the routes to classical dance now have also changed, you know. Um, and then also is that actually what else can you do with that and knowledge? Um, but the African teacher that I was telling you about at Elmhurst, he actually went to Hammond, which is a boarding school here for people hey. wanting to dance. And so he did classical dance for five years, but then he went to Alvin Ailey. Uh, he, he went to Alvin Ailey school in, in the States. Uh, yeah. And his mum was an African dancer, but in, you know, they were from Manchester. <laughs> so oh, it's interesting. Yeah, that's, that, that's the point really, that there yeah, can be yeah. unexpected crossovers. And mm -hmm. actually the best dancers uh, I've come across here, um, the best African dancers anyway, were actually English and they learned, uh, you know, black English um, mm -hmm. uh, dancers who learned it here in, in England. So it's, it's kind of amazing really. I think that's so wonderful that the best yeah. African dancers have never been to Africa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's that exposure that they also have there and yes. the, uh, and. Not the cliche, and, and I think maybe also ballet is, is uh, not that well. Uh, I mean, not known about as much, you know. Yes. In, yes. In maybe Africa. Actually, there's, a, there's a new book that's come out, and it's called Reclaiming Ballet, and it's written by an African, uh, you know, someone who's. Mm -hmm. I think she's Dutch. She's a black woman, and and if you look carefully at the origins of. Um, contemporary dance and ballet, it all starts in Africa. Really? Wow. Yeah. 
So I think that's that interesting. Fascinating. But, yeah. but I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. But, and actually some of it, the footwork in Africa, African dance is so fast mm. and rhythmically complex. And also there's something in ballet called a, uh, a soda basque. And one of the tribes do what looks really like a soda basque and they jump in the air and turn around twice and land, um, which in classical ballet is called a soda basque. But it's kind of interesting. There, there were unexpected parallels mm -hmm. and, and striking connections. That's between. amazing. Yeah, I'll, I'll go and have a look at that book. Yeah, it's, it's I'm not sure whether it's out yet, but that, that's oh, what. Yeah, but it will be, yeah. Mm. Um, Listen, Mark, you are you are such an interesting man. Um, and well, but thank you. Uh, my, my pleasure. Just one thing I actually forgot to ask you, but uh, this is be fascinating. What did you do apart from all this wonderful creative work? Um, did you do something that you've never done before, like I don't know, baking mm. or cooking or or doing some uh, uh, other? Because I know you said you've been painting, but. Um, mm -hmm. Here in I'm Vienna not. was a baritone who bought chickens. Did you go to that link? <laughs> uh, well, I had chickens when I was a kid. Oh, really? I lived in the country, so I had chickens. But it was no good me having chickens, because every time um, people thought, well, let's eat one, I wouldn't let them do that. Oh, <laughs> in, in the way that, so in the end, they had to give them away. Oh, okay. I've got fond, fond memories of chickens. And then we moved into the town, and we weren't allowed chickens. Um, what, what, what can I say? I've been quite obsessed with what I do. I suppose um, I've got a very influential friend who's a Shakespeare expert. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned a lot about Shakespeare just by being her friend. Oh, really? Um, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And also, when I went to Rombert as the director, I knew nothing about science. In fact, I could quite, I can say that at school I was a complete completely rubbish at physics mm -hmm. and I had my own physics professor who would come and have tea with me every two weeks and talk about um, Brownian, Brownian in motion and the photoelectric effect and E equals NC squared and so I ended up making a dance about those things um, uh, but the, the big thing is probably contemporary art mm. oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. even though it is part of dance Somehow or other, I ended up knowing a lot about that mm -hmm. and science. Um, uh, you know, I consider myself to be quite spiritual. But, and my professor friends, she says, well, I'm spiritual. I do yoga. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so those two big things, you know, science and contemporary art, they're, they're things I wasn't really, I didn't really grow up with. Um, and it was a big revelation to me. Uh, you know, when, when I started digging deeper into science, physics especially, you know, and it's the world of mathematics. So, um, you know, and at school I was always considered too dumb to do things like that. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, what's important is to keep alive curiosity. Exactly. You know, to feed children curiosity all the time, you know. If they're curious about something, do, you know. Mm -hmm. to, I think yeah, I think this time has, has for many artists given them that just bit of freedom, you know, to mm, mm. explore other things. And this is why I always ask, because it's very interesting, um, you know, what, what, you know, things that you thought mm. about, and then when you come to a standstill, mm. it's almost as if the artist's minds keep on going places, you know, and, and exploring new things. And, and I think this is part of an artist. And I think this is also mm. one of the things that I think when we could teach children art, this would be the result. You know, we will, we will, we, we think now to teach them maths will, will and, and science will, you know, bring new development in the world, but actually mm. art will, because, yeah. they, you know, when they, when they were taught art, uh, mm. and they become a scientist, then of course their creativity and creative thinking would be so much mm. different. That's what that's what I tell you about Nikki. Nikki, yeah. Nikki yeah. Being creative with the information. Yeah. Um, because what we have in common is that because she looks after all these crows, um, she has to work out that, that you know what kind of exper experiments she's going to do with them. And you know she, she doesn't know what the result is going to be, and she doesn't know, uh, and so she has to keep coming up with creative things the whole time. And that's what we, we discovered we had that in common. 
because mm. when I was working on the repertoire and trying to think of new ideas for dance, you've just got to keep going over and over and stuff and, 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 and putting yourself into that uh, creative mindset and, and see what happens. And yeah. so it's, there's something called flow actually, um, which was discovered by a, a, a psychologist from um, uh, Hungary called Chick Sent Mihai. And it's when um, you're doing something really difficult physically and mentally. So you get the brain and body meeting and you know the inner critic shuts down, um, uh, all your decisions feel right. Uh, you know, you feel really in, in the zone and connected. So that, that's been quite interesting, um, you know, especially for dancers. Mm. So we've oh, yes, also, mm. we've been trying to work out whether or, you know, dancers can learn new things every day, quite complex. 20% of them are dyslexic, but they, they have this other skill of learning all this complex stuff physically and mentally. We've, be, we've been trying to work out whether that's a transferable skill. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it, um, these things also, these, these qualities that you're now talking about, um, mm. there are so many that you find in artists that also in musicians, you know, and, and, mm. and I think these are things that if we can give this to children, of course, mm. you know, mm. how wonderful would we have a, a society not just appreciating things and appreciating art, but then also having these skills to um, to create a better life. Mm. Absolutely, I, I, I think curiosity and creativity it does give you a you know, lovely life. Mm. You know, it depends, it depends what you want. But the thing is, when I did my business course um, and I told them I was creative, they, they used me all the time to think try and get them to think of new things. And when I was on tour in China, I hope, I hope I hadn't bored you with this before. No, all, no, not at all. All they, all they asked me was, how do we make up a new idea? China, mm. we work really hard, really, really, really hard, but actually we're just no good at making up new ideas, you know? And so I was giving talks at agricultural colleges and I wondered why I was there. And then suddenly it was like, I, I, my specialty is food. But how do I make up a new food? You tell me, how can I do that? <laughs> and these are things like that. It's a way of thinking, isn't it? It's not necessarily, now we're gonna do this, now we're gonna do that. And exactly. then connect, yeah. the connecting, connecting the dots might take you somewhere else completely different. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the humanity is coming in. It's meeting of minds. It's actually the development of new cultures because those things have met, you mm -hmm. know, and, and what I like about using a piece of music that was written in 1740 now is that you get sort of me mental time travel, you know, between oh, all yes. of those things. So our brain can mentally try and travel much faster than anything else because it's such a complex, amazing instrument. Um, and, and of course, the older you get, the more experience you have that you can mentally time travel backwards and forwards too. So it's uh, all of those things in which the humanities can can give you, uh, you know, they're invaluable from my point of view. So, and then when I wrote the syllabus, which I haven't published yet, but this is the dance column. And then the other, this one is about um, connecting to, you know, other stuff like drawing, painting, listening to music. And this is how to look after yourself, um, you know, because often young students, they just drive themselves into the ground once they get obsessed by something and forget that actually to be creative, you need to be quite relaxed. Exactly, yeah, no, exactly. And, um, and I think that comes also in time and, and experiences, you know, because um, mm. yeah, I've, I found my daughter had a, a injury that put her off dance for a year. And actually in that time, uh, she was young and, and when she, when I got the call and, and she told me, um, I immediately knew from my age perspective that this would be a year where she would learn a lot, you know. Yeah. Yes. And it was, it was actually, you know, that she, in that year, you know, many people came on her path and she learned many things and, and experienced many things that she still now talks about and, and still now thinks about. And 
And I think that is that's something uh, also in in this time. This is why I believe this this year or or how long it will be mm. will for us all be uh, have a worth. You know, we we can yes, we there are many negative things, and, and I'm not dismissing that. And I'm, I know for some people it's financially really a hard time that they cannot imagine something else. But I think in a five years time or, or more, when we look back at this time, mm. uh, we will we will really remember the good things and uh, and, and the positive things. And mm. I think then we will see what this time actually did for us all. Uh, mm. So I don't think we will, and not any of us will come unchanged out of this, you know? I just remembered one thing I have done, which I haven't done before, is I'm doing a coaching course. Oh, um, okay, yeah. Um, and it's called um, Transition Excellence, and it's from people who had top jobs and then they're transitioning into something else. <coughs> you oh, know. Yeah. And I thought, well, that applies to me. But mm. uh, actually, the course is how to teach other people to do that transition because oh, it's all about perspectives. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and I suppose as a creative, I'm still slightly on the outside of the mainstream because they all had, you know, big jobs in, in, in with. With corporations, or um, uh, you know, it's it's you know it's very high flying businesses where they made a lot of money, uh, and there's little old me as a you know artistic director and a choreographer, and it's well, basically just a dancer still, you know. But but I can use all those things too. Yeah, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's a misconception really that just mm -hmm. people with mm -hmm. a lot of money are seen mm -hmm. as you know, some sort of status or, or successful. But I mean, mm. I think this is also the perception that, that the world has. And this is why I think artists yeah. should talk. Which is really interesting if you're creative because you would never think that. Exactly. But this uh. is what I find, I find fascinating also about artists is that even though they're, the money is the situation, you know, that the financial yeah. part, you know, and, and, and we, they have to eat and they have to pay the mm. rent. And so on. Mm. But what was so amazing was when I would speak to the artists that I photographed in their windows, you know, we would talk mm. about these and the, the difficult situation, but the moment they are in the window, it, mm. it's like a switch. It's like there, they just there, you know, and they just, it's like this, window with where they just give everything and yes, I, that's called flow <laughs> yeah and <laughs> well, they're in the moment and and i and then i realized you know that um it, it's it's not about the money it, it, well it is in a, a part is about the money because we have to survive but Absolutely. for them the sadness and the and the frustration really is that they cannot perform that they cannot give and that they mm -hmm. cannot, you know, present or whatever they have. Their souls. Exactly, and it's that thing. And and um, and I and I thought about that also. That if you think of the 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 uh, um, the many hours of practicing, the the many things. If you if you look at your career, for example, everything you went through, all the sacrifices you made. Um, and then you go on stage, you give this, and there's an applause, say, for 10 minutes or, or mm. so. Mm. And that's, that's really enough. You know, it's, that's what, that, what the, the, I mean, some people say it's not the applause, but I think the applause from the audience is like a showing of gratitude. But I yes. think it's just this energy, this energy of um, I've given something and it has been well received. And and I think for you know, artists, you know, described it as a kind of ecstasy. What you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the thing that people don't understand. You know, mm. for artists, the frustration now is not as much as the, the government giving them more money, but mm. the government opening the theaters or the govern the government. Uh, you know, choreographer explained it to me this way. He said it's like. A bird being put in a cage, but just to make it worth, the wings are cut off as well. Mm. You know, and I think this is this uh, maybe this feeling, this frustrating feeling. 
yes, it's different for me because I can go to the studio and still improvise and hobble about making mm-hmm. up steps and things like that. But I think for like freelance dancers, um, they can't because they need an audience who's going to respond to them. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and also, I suppose at university, I, I had the pleasure of, in the holidays, I joined a street theatre group. And so I earned my, my holiday money by doing that. And I um, think a lot of dancers don't want to do that, you see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there are, uh, there are other things. It, 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 actually, if we could find a way of giving them the space, that's another thing, you know, how do you... Yeah. But the, the thing is, um, I think what creativity gives you is uh, lots of different options, rather than if you think about the creative brain being a, like a forest and me always taking just one road all the time it's not it's you know mm. they say no go somewhere else if the money doesn't come from here look somewhere else you know yeah. or if I can't if, if I can't perform what else can I do that would give yeah. me that same thing you know this is a great um uh, picture that you're describing mm. it now yeah but I but I, and I got that from doing the coaching course actually oh okay I see because yeah, okay. you know um I often think well what if they don't give me the money I you know, the project will fall over and all that sort of thing. And the answer is ask someone else if they'd mm. like to be part of it, I suppose. So it's, there's always mm. other options. And I yeah. think it's quite difficult being a dancer because you're working in one bubble for one particular thing and one performance. And so it could be in the future that it can't be that. It, always, mm. it has to be all these other things. There's, there's an online pres- presence, there's several essays, there's an art gallery showing, there's a street performance, there's, mm. you know, working on the next thing. So, mm. so, so you like, have to be like an artist, you've got several paintings facing the wall with, waiting for some attention um, and like working like that backwards and forwards. So dan- dancers in the future, it seems to me that they have to be teachers, they have to be creators. They'll be doing, you know, a, lo- a lot of them here teach Pilates and, um, you know, other kinds of physical disciplines in between performing, you know, because it's rather like being an actor when, right. when, when you're not on stage, you're doing other things. So, but, you know, people like to have that one thing sometimes, you yeah. know, and, and I always thought it was curious being in Rombe because the choreographers in my day never explained what they did. Uh, oh, you know. You wouldn't go up to Miss Cunningham and saying, well, what's this all about? You know, he's making these wildly super physical, quite mad uh, dance phrases and putting them all together, um, but not playing the music until the night of the performance. You know, it's wild uh, um, electronic music. And then having incredible artists do the sets and costumes. It was, you know, it was so wonderful and refreshing. But you, you could never ask him what it was about. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I <laughs> Whereas now you, you can't do that with dancers. They, they need and want to know everything. Mm-hmm. Or they, they're leaning into wanting to know everything because they, they, they're more curious and they want to learn. You know, they're not just there to obey the choreographer. So all our roles have changed in a way. I mean, choreographers don't want them to change because they love being in charge, but it's just not true anymore. You know, you know what I mean? They, what Going through COVID, it's, meant that there are certain kinds of hierarchies I think have crumbled actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so maybe that's yeah, so maybe that that was mm. in all a good thing, I think, you know. Yes, we have to help them do it. I think, you know, it's hard to just look out in space and think, well, yes, all these alternatives, but if you're not if you don't have those alternatives um, and you don't know about them, it's going to be much harder. Uh, and, and I see that happening quite a lot. I worked with a filmmaker uh, not so long ago, a really great young black filmmaker, really talented. He'd never heard of Fellini. Do you know oh, who really? I mean? The, the, the Italian filmmaker from the... Oh, from yeah, the yeah, 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 no, yeah. But never heard of him, never heard of him. <laughs> you know, and he'd spent all his time at, at film school. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> So at Bromby is just near the um, National Theatre and uh, um, and the the National Film, uh, uh, the BFI, um, and so I went and bought it for. I bought uh, one of the real classic films, black in black and white, for him. <laughs> but, yeah. The thing about um, talent is it's not 
um, it's not that um, common and it's, um, you know, very liberally spread. And so not everyone has it. Um, and, uh, and I used to audition people, especially choreographers, and I'd ask to look at their notebooks because if someone's in the bubble, they're there all the time. They're not coming in, into it and out of it, like going for work, you're there all the time. And actually, when, as director, I sort of came out of it because most of the time it was firefighting. Mm. So it's a, it, it was great because um, COVID had given me the time to go back to full time thinking about my own creativity. But, but there we are. You know, and of That's course. Fun. Yeah, this, this uh, th as I said, this, this is also what many artists say, musicians as well, conductors as well. Mm. Uh, Know that they really went inside themselves and, and thought about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Mark, this has been wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.